knowing that we cannot do this work in isolation, um, community is at the center and at the heart of Food Lab yeah. Detroit. You are a community. Yeah. I'm wondering what kinds of challenges are you at Food Lab able to, to face and to push past because you are this collective? What are some things that you're able to do that you couldn't do if it was just all these individual businesses sort of fighting for themselves? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, um, and so, one of the things that I think is so important when you have a community of food entrepreneurs that belong to um, this organization called Food Lab Detroit, and we are about 209 locally owned businesses in the city of Detroit that belong to Food Lab, which, which, which is great, who are at, at all varying stages of their business. And so I think the first thing to lift up is that when you have a collective and a community of businesses that are all working together, the first thing is, has to be, there's this adage that says, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you but know. it's who you know, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think you lifted that up when it, when, in, in regards to the condiments. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sometimes, I mean, Beth is, is, is a, was, a, was a person that was in your life who helped mm -hmm. to move your business forward. Right. Imagine having 200 yeah. Beths in your life <laughs> to move your business forward. Yeah. It's not what you know sometimes, it's who you know. So being, a, being in a community of food businesses at all different types of levels, and when we say food businesses, so we have folks who are creating specialty food products or added value products for grocery stores, people who own and operate food trucks, mm -hmm. folks who are restaurant tours, bakers, coffee shops, deli. Can you imagine, mm -hmm. could you imagine for a moment a community of food entrepreneurs who are at different business stages and operate different businesses, the collaboration that takes place? Mm -hmm. So no longer does, does, a, does a, a mom or a dad or an entrepreneur who's in their home making jams and jellies, do they not have to worry about this, this word called scale mm -hmm. when they approach someone at maybe a grocery store or Whole Foods. They don't have to worry about, I don't know where I'm going to get the capital that I need to scale my business because someone at Whole Foods said they will only take it if I provide them a pallet. Now they can go to a food lab entrepreneur who's in our community who owns a very small hyper local store and say, you don't have to make a pallet, just give me 10. You understand that changes now the relationship when you see entrepreneurs working together. When someone opens up a deli or a coffee shop and says, you know what, I want to focus on making and brewing the best possible coffee I can for my community. How about you, Mrs. Baker, or you, Mr. Baker, you provide all of the baked goods that are going to be mm -hmm. in my coffee shop. Can you imagine the cross-pollinization mm -hmm. that's happening now within our community? Can you imagine the intersectionality that has happened in our, in our community with the young people and the elders. When you have an elder that is making something called chow chow and a young person says, well, Miss Deborah, what is that? And she goes on to the narrative and says, baby, chow chow is something from the South that we used to make as a relish, as a condiment where we use tomatoes. That's something that y'all don't know about. Understand that that, that is happening. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's not what you know, but it's who you know and then the collaboration that takes place. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is so very powerful, and Jordan, you mentioned it, is that now I have a whole body of businesses where I can create content, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So now, to Vaughn's point about narrative, is that I now have the ability to be in close, close proximity yep. with businesses who are operating, so now I don't have to wait for the Washington Post. I don't have mm -hmm. to wait for the New York Times or the Detroit Free Press or Bon Appetit or Food and Wine to validate these entrepreneurs. I can now validate them all by myself. Woo. And I can lift their stories up. And now I can write about them. And I can share with the world through this amazing medium, social media, whether it be on Facebook or Twitter or We Use Exposure or with any platform podcast that I want to lift up these amazing entrepreneurs in their local community doing amazing work. And why that is so important is because, I don't know about y'all in New York, but we have a little bit of problem in Detroit particularly around black foodways being colonized. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Let me speak up. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, for some reason, I don't know why, but I read in, I don't know if it was food or public, or I don't know if it was eater, but <laughs> I love y'all in New York, but for some reason, a publication out of New York said that Brooklyn makes the best fried chicken Stop. in the country. Stop. I, Stop. I, 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 what? <laughs> and when, what? And when I looked, <laughs> Lord Jesus, help me God. And, and when I looked, <laughs> You know, and maybe it was bait click, Julia. I don't, I don't know what it was, but you know, I clicked on it. I said, "Oh, Brooklyn makes the best fried chicken in the country." Let me, let me. I know Sylvia ain't in Brooklyn, but let me click on it anyway. <laughs> let me just click. And so I clicked, and not one restaurant owned by a person of color was on the list. So I said, "Oh, okay." It, it, so, so this this narrative that that that, that soul food of all, fried chicken. And ain't no black people on the list. Fried chicken, y'all. And there's no black people on the list. And so there's this narrative too around <laughs> even Kentucky Fried Chicken. Tried to try to try to try to say that you know uh, hot chicken that was created and invented by princes down in 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 Nashville, Tennessee. You, you, it's just collard greens. Neiman Marcus had collard greens. Um, so Y'all remember this? Collard mm -hmm. greens. Neiman Marcus had collard greens on sale for sixty-eight dollars. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And we're shipping in Holland. It was like eighty-five dollars for ten people for collard greens. I mean, it's just <laughs> ridiculous the way. And it's just it is it's so important because food is culture. It's history, it's tradition. And don't play with soul food. Don't play with it. Don't mess with it. If you're not putting love in it, if you're not seasoning that thing to the ancestors tell you to stop. Yes. <laughs> Cause ain't no measuring, ain't no measuring when it comes to soul food. Not for real. You just start putting stuff on it till your grandmama comes to you and say, baby, that's enough. <laughs> Don't play with the culture like that. And I'm not even speaking for just, just, just the soul food from Africa. I'm talking about food from Puerto Rico. I'm mm -hmm. talking food from Somalia. There is something that is innate about us when it comes to food and the way we express ourselves when it comes to food. So it is important for me to lift up the narrative. And then the third thing that I think that is so important, and I'm just going to end it right here because I want to get to Q&A. And y'all don't know my father's a minister, so y'all give me a mic <laughs> and an audience. And I will preach the word of food all day long. Um, and so I think there's this third thing that's so beautiful about being, and I'm going to try to hold myself when I talk about this because it's a beautiful thing. I think the third thing that's so important and so beautiful about being in a community with food entrepreneurs, where Food Lab, the only thing we've done, Julia, is create this platform mm -hmm. where folks can participate. So we've created a participatory platform where folks can plug in. And I think the most beautiful thing about it is that we truly understand that we are trying to dismantle shit and build shit up a different way mm -hmm. at yes. the same time. Mm -hmm. yes. And I think one of the number one challenges yes. to your point around food entrepreneurship, particularly in black and brown communities, is the access to capital. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. and how accessing capital for black and brown entrepreneurs is rooted in structural and institutional mm -hmm. racism, particularly when you're dealing with mainstream banks and, and institutional banking and yes. whatnot. And it's a beautiful thing. When, when, when I heard this story from an entrepreneur who called me on the phone crying, and I said to her, I said, I said Callie, what's wrong? Why, why, why are you crying? She said, Davida, you're not going to believe what happened to me. I said, what happened? And she said, you know, I just started my smoothie and my juice business. I said, I said, yeah. And she said, um, Erica and Kirsten stopped by um, just a few moments ago. Erica and Kirsten are um, a, a couple who owns not one, but two uh, locations for a business that's called Detroit Vegan Soul. And so she said, Erica and Kirsten just stopped by to see if I was okay, to come into the juice bar and see if everything was all right, to see if I needed anything. Just showing their support. Mm -hmm. These are black women 
who show up and wanted to just see if I needed anything. I said, well, that's a good thing. Why, what, what's, the, what's the problem? <laughs> like, like, why are you crying? She said, they came and we talked and I fixed them some juice and we talked some more. And then they left. And they were out in the car and they called me on the phone and they told me to come out. And I came out to the car and Kirsten rolled down the window and she handed me an envelope. And I opened the envelope and it was $5,000. And she said that, Davida, you don't know this, but a group of black women who belong to Food Lab Detroit made a pack. Mm. And that pack was is that they were going to pay it forward. Mm. That once they got to a point in their business where they could just give another black woman money to help them start their business, that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't wait for the day that I have reached a point in my business mm -hmm. where I can give another sister $5,000. together, that working together, that knowing that you don't have to worry about going to a bank if you need $5,000. I got you. Mm. That right there and being a part of mm -hmm. a community is why I do this. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have more questions, but I think I'd rather leave it to everyone here. Thank you all so much. You all inspire me so much with everything you do. I think you inspire everyone here, and I just appreciate you all being here. And I think we know that, that words matter, and stories matter, and, and showing up matters. So um, yeah, thank you. And I'll leave it to you guys. You can ask us group questions, individual, whatever. Julia, oh, I also have a copy of the, I can get a copy of the book, so you can show it to everybody. Oh, yeah. thanks, Jordan. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God, getting us life. Are you nourished yet? <laughs> Are you? It was building on from, from Umu and Alex to here, building on it. I feel so good. This is exactly what we wanted to lift up and bring. It's not just food. You know, we do work in food, we talk about food, we eat food, but our work is connected in stories, history, resiliency, resistance. This is what we're really hoping that the Just Food Conference is and continues to be about, and bringing just different voices and stories to the stage, real in, in, in the audience. I had other words and I can't even pull them together, so I'm gonna just let the question and answers go. But first, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for sharing and, and to coming and being here. Thank you, Davida. This was your, your baby, your vision, oh, your dream. You. you brought it to me. So I can only say thank you to you all for being willing to come and share and r roll with us at this conference. Mm -hmm. So question and answers, let's get to it. Yeah. I know you got questions. The microphone's coming. Is this on? Okay. So uh, you guys all know that I'm with Drive Change, but I wanted to, I'm inspired by the thought of like community and just hearing everyone speak. And so I want, Jordan, if you can, just to, if there's an opportunity to talk about like what things are happening right now so that, because we're, we're in, you know, I'm feeling the, the energy. Yeah. And I think that everyone just, we're doing so many great things. I want people to come out and support and just know what we're doing. So, uh, Thank you, Kirk. Yes. What, a, <laughs> what a great unprompted question. That's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, so specifically at Drive Change right now, I'm so excited. We're all so excited, clearly. Uh, we have uh, three new projects that we've been working really, really hard on, and we're going to pilot two of them this summer and spring. The first is our Hospitality for Social Justice training and fellowship. So uh, our fellowship traditionally has been using our own food truck business as the platform to work with uh, young adults, eight young adults coming home from jail um, every year. This year is the first year that we're working on and, and piloting an affiliation strategy. So we're actually gonna be partnering with three other food companies 
uh, where they're the managers from these, the businesses of these companies are gonna go through a uh, racial justice, um, social justice lens training and coaching at Drive Change. And then the fellows, the young people are gonna go through our own internal training, but for eight months, they're gonna work at these other businesses and restaurants. And then our team is going to coach not just the fellows, but the managers from those businesses as well. Yeah, it's really exciting. We're really pumped about it. Um, uh, so uh, if you're a young person or you're someone who knows a young person who's been impacted by the criminal justice system, we are openly recruiting for our June cohort. You can go onto our website. There's an application online. If you don't have access to the internet, there's a phone number. Um, there are, we have flyers that we'll pass out here today, and then there's a phone number on that to call uh, or text and we'll get you a hard copy application as well. Um, the second project that we're working on, which this space is like the best space for us to be in right now because it's, it's uh, we, we, we need a catchy title for this project, so please think about that throughout. <laughs> but there are access and awareness days. So what we've decided to do with our food truck this year is we're gonna curate two events a month. One awareness event, which is gonna be in uh, Union Square. We're hopefully gonna develop, the, we're, we're developing the relationship and partnership. We already have a relationship, a partnership with Grow NYC to be in Union Square for awareness days, which are gonna happen once a month. They're gonna raise awareness about a, a, a social justice issue inside of our systems. So we're gonna focus on uh, ending cash bail, the shitty quality of food in prison, and uh, closing Rikers Island. And so those, <laughs> Those events are happening once a month starting in May. Uh, we need volunteers, we need people to come out to help us get all the curation around these events done. The second day of month that we're doing is an access day. So we're going to go to a food insecure neighborhood. Our first neighborhood for the first four months in a row is gonna be Brownsville, but then we're gonna be expanding to other communities as well, uh, where we're going to go with our truck and we're gonna connect with the community organizers from that specific um, neighborhood to all work together to raise awareness about food insecurity in the neighborhood. Uh, our, our truck will be serving that day like a, a menu that is all about access. So from stores with, and, and resources from within the neighborhood uh, and really kind of working to connect people to some uh, of their resources that they might not know exist within their own community. So those are the two um, food, I mean, it's, we, what we need is a name for like the access and awareness days. Uh, so think about that. And then <laughs> the third thing, um, we were funded in the fall uh, to build a, um, a basically a very similar project to mm -hmm. Food Lab actually. It's a, it's a co-working commissary. So it's a, it's a space for like-minded food businesses. Uh, it's, like, it's very much like Food Lab. It's a, it's a we work for so social justice food businesses. Uh, you know, think of like a 40,000 square foot face, space that's production focused but also has consumer facing elements and every business that's a part of that space needs to go through our hospitality for social justice training and hire young adults coming home from jail. So we're in the process now, this year, we're actually writing an RFP for a subcontractor for Food Lab to apply to be our manager and operator. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, <laughs> And Put other people, and other people who want to apply can also apply. But there's a lunch break out. It's a, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, really, we are we are looking for a subcontractor to oper to really go into business with us and operate this space. We understand our core competency is not in running a giant food space; it's in actually doing the culture, the training, the development work. So we want to find a great partner to do it. So thank you for letting me have that uh, to tell you what we're to tell you what we're, we're working on. Appreciate it. Hi. Oh, wow, this is really loud. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, I'm from Detroit. I work in uh, DPSCD school districts, and I have a question about pers persistence and resistance as a whole. Um, I'm very inspired by all of you. It's beautiful hearing all of you speak. Um, but this world that we live in takes a lot of energy, and this work that we do takes a lot of energy, and I'm wondering how you find 
the time or how you manage to continue doing the work that you do without checking out specifically when it applies to youth and how you keep them from checking out. Because the students that I work with, and I have one with me here, um, they're on East and West Side schools. This isn't particular to her situation, but this is most of these kids. They're on the East and West Side. The schools are shitty. Their lives aren't much better. So getting them to really focus on what's going on in the world and want to be a part of the change is very difficult. And it's hard for me dealing with the things that they're dealing with and trying to be supportive and not checking out at times. So I'm wondering how you guys keep it going mm -hmm. for so long. Are you, are you a teacher? Yeah, I'm an after school teacher, so I'm not a real teacher because I couldn't deal with the system. No, 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 no,
on the after school. Yes, you can. But they got to be rooted in a household where moms or dads or aunties or uncles, they are also pouring into our young people as well. So they're getting it from every place, honey. They get, let me tell you something. Somebody is working with Naomi Waller, that 11-year-old girl oh, yeah. who stood in the gap for all black women and girls who spoke so eloquently. Go look at her mama and her daddy. This is Sunday. My mom and daddy told me, you teach a child the way in which he should, her, her should go, and they will not depart. That's Psalms 20 seconds. I gave you all a word today. I was going to try to figure out how I was going to work that in, Julia. But the, the fact of the matter is, what to answer your question, baby, is that teachers can't do it alone. Yeah. They can't do everything by themselves. We got to get mothers and daddies and grandmamas, and, and we got to get a whole community involved to keep these children focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Um, oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh. I just want to add to um, or answer your question or say something to that. I grew up in Seattle with no parents <laughs> and no relatives. What, for me, was the most important thing growing up was my after-school program at Rainier Community mm -hmm. Center and my fifth grade teacher, Ms. Buki, both groups took interest in me after school and made sure I was safe and ate. But the one thing that they provided me with was consistency. Yeah. Mm. So I would encourage you to be consistent. Yeah. A lot, I had, no, I had no stability growing up. And so to be able to look forward to Ms. Buki and to be able to look forward to Zoom, my, my day camp counselor at Rainier Community Center and my preteen and my uh, four age group, saved me and led me in the ways which I've gone. So be consistent. Even when you don't feel like showing up, show up for them. And do it with a smile on your face if possible. Well, it's also just, we, the, the panel later today is, is about healing in this movement, which I think is incredibly important. I mean, real trauma, people experience institutional trauma for, for centuries. Uh, so as much vision work as we can do about what does the future look like, we have to address trauma yeah. and he real healing. Um, uh, so providing space where people can be their whole selves mm -hmm. and can heal. Thank you. Um, this question is for Ms. Davison, and I'd like to hear Ms. Hassan and Ms. Lexington, Jordan, um, speak on it as well. The um, Ms. Davidson, when you were talking about gentrification and resisting gentrification through home ownership and business ownership, yeah. um, that made a lot of sense to me. And I'm wondering how important in business ownership it is to own the place of the business mm. in that resisting gentrification. How important it is to own the place. The, the, you mean the, the building? land in your experience with your 200 yeah yeah, yeah. Th there is jordan there was something that you said that that business is really um nothing but um people making decisions yeah. and so here's why i think um ownership um is is so very um important <laughs> because land and property is so important in this country that is written in the constitution mm -hmm a constitution that was not written in the mind for, for black folks. So, but you know it's important because it, they, they, they specifically speak about land ownership and property ownership. And so I think number one is that business ownership gives people the right or the opportunity to exercise power mm -hmm. and, to, and to make differences and changes in their local community. And so I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, one example why I think business ownership in the community in Detroit is so important. And if anybody in Detroit who lives in the community can tell you this, and I'm not making this up, and I'm not, I'm not sure if, this is, if it's like this, I'm in New York. But the main problem, particularly around uh, business ownership through, through the lens of food in Detroit, is that you have people that are outside of the city of Detroit owning businesses in the city of Detroit. And when you own a business that is not in the community that you live in, from my experience, what happens is that business owner takes resources, money, outside of the city and takes it back out to the suburbs where they live in. So local dollars 
are not circulating within the community. Let me, let me tell you how that intersects with food. Is that when you have Detroiters, which the city of Detroit is made up of 82% African Americans, and when you have business owners who own food businesses who don't give a damn about the type of food-ish that they are putting in those food businesses, what is happening is that they're now contributing to diet-related diseases, yeah? Mm -hmm. When you have folks who are actually not intersectional in the way that they are thinking, is that now you have sugar, salt, potato chips, soda, or in Detroit we call it pop, that is now just, you, and then you have marketing and narratives that are driving our young people, hot Cheetos for breakfast, I know y'all know what I'm talking about, yeah. that these children are, are, are eating, is that you're now contributing to the death, really, of black folks in your community, in your neighborhood. So the, the importance of ownership in Detroit is that we look at ownership through an intersectional lens. Not only is it important for us to have power and to make decisions about who we hire. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. one decision about who we hire. But we also make a decision about what goes into that store and we make a decision about what that store looks like. In Detroit, we have, we have stores, gas stations, party stores, in New York y'all call them bodegas, party stores, corner stores, fast food restaurants where Detroiters who live in that community actually are even in the store and they are served through a plexiglass window. Well, they have to put their money through a plexiglass window in a turnstile that separates now the owner from the consumer. Can you imagine what a, what a Detroiter must feel like when they're going to a store in their community and how they automatically feel when you have this barrier that is there, that is separating the owner who sometimes acknowledges them, sometimes doesn't, and just takes their money? It's about transaction. But what we are trying to do at Food Lab is not make it transactional, but make it based on relationships, right? So we control how that store looks. And then, the, 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 again, again, about not who we hire, but what we serve. Why is what we serve so important through an intersectional lens? It is because folks like Kirsten and Erica, who own Detroit Vegan Soul, or Callie Braffer, who owns Detroit Smoothies, or when you have Devery and, 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 and her husband, Jason, who owns Brooklyn Street Local, they make the decision on what that supply chain looks like when they are serving ingredients in the store. They make a conscientious effort that I am going to locally source my ingredients for my restaurant, my coffee shop, my deli, from the 1,500 urban gardens and farms and growers and farmers in Detroit. That means a rising tide now lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. I'm supporting the farmers, yes. and I'm providing healthy food in my community. You see, this thing is just more than just mm -hmm. business. It's about how we are trying to, at scale, transform this whole food economy. Mm -hmm. That's why business is so important, because you can use the power of business to do good in your community. And then I'll say the last thing, and I know y'all had this happen in New York, because it happened all over the country, is that you know what was the difference between saving the Lower East Side of the community uh, in, in, uh, in New York, the Lower East Side, and the difference between what happened particularly in the Bronx when something that was called the urban revitalization movement that was coming through and creating highways that was destroying black and brown communities all over this country under the name of urban renewal? It was the fact that Jane Jacobson, J uh, was, was, that, was that her name in, in, in the Lower East Side? Yeah. Jane Jacobs, how she organized the community to save the Lower East Side and says, oh no, you won't, Robert Moses, you build a highway through the Lower East Side. Now, am I lying? Y'all gotta know y'all history. You won't build a highway, not through the Lower East Side you want, and so they decided to build one through up in the Bronx. Well, the same thing happened to Detroit. The same thing happened in Atlanta. The same thing happened in St. Louis. Let me tell you something. When legislation comes past in Detroit, if you think I'm not galvanizing the community of entrepreneurs and say, oh, hell no, y'all not, not in this community, not with this legislation, I get grants. I'm going to tell y'all a secret. I know I'm on YouTube or Facebook or whatever y'all doing. <laughs> That's fine. I, I definitely get funding because I am a nonprofit director. I definitely get funding from our partners to provide entrepreneurial training, incubation, acceleration. But what I really do is I organize. That's what that body of entrepreneurs is all about. It's about organizing and being able to speak in one unified voice when all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm.
Well, just one, one quick thing that I'll add to that question is just on the topic. We're not going to have a ton of time around this question more, but on the topic of like uh, co-ownership um, and just the power of co-ownership. And I, it's something that I'm particularly really interested in and, and uh, in this space, how we get people that, that work for businesses to actually own the business themselves. Um, uh, you know, land ownership in New York City is incredibly prohibitively expensive. Uh, and obviously that is because of the structures of race that we've been talking about and power that we've been talking about on this panel. Um, uh, but I think at every level, when you can think about the ways that, that the people who are doing the work can actually be the ones benefiting financial, financially with actual dollars in their pocket, uh, that that is really interesting. And there is something I heard about that's called um, community bonds. It's, a, it's an initiative to have a community buy a building. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of, think, I, I don't know a lot about it, but I think it's an interesting concept. So that would be something else to look into. Um, <laughs> I, I own Best Best 100%. I fund Best Best 100%. Um, we, we are made in a co-packing facility that is ran by a group of women. So about five to eight women make my sauces on any given week. We source locally from farmers um, upstate, except for a few things like our cilantro and shredded coconut, I think, are sourced elsewhere. Um, the power of owning it 100% up until now has given me the opportunity to approach investors that are women. Um, I'm trying to keep my company 100% women owned uh, for as long as possible. I'm trying to um, keep the narrative the same for as long as possible, no matter, you know, Whole Foods says we want you nationally and we can't do that right now. Um, but the point is, is that having it be mine and having it be a woman-owned business is going to allow my daughters, the way that I see it anyways, to continue my legacy and to continue the stories of Somalia and Africa in a positive light. That is true, that's powerful. Okay. How many, just we probably yeah, time maybe for time one, for one, one more. more. Or no, or no. One more? One more? One more. Okay. <laughs> Yell it! We can hear you. <laughs> I said, come on, we're up here. We got to speak. <laughs> that's oh. fine. That's fine. All right, shout it then. So my question is for Van Diaz. I'm from Puerto Rico, too. Yes. Woo! Yes. And on some level, we all are. But mm. my real question is, with the tragedy that has happened, I myself am a holistic doctor, and in my community, I inspire people with the wild food, mm -hmm. right? So in Puerto Rico, with all that lush, beautiful forestry and weeds, are there chefs out there, are there communities saying, can we use our wild food and bring that to the table? Mm -hmm. Because I don't see that as much in New York. You go to the Latino stores, yeah. and we see lettuce, and tomatoes, but we know in Puerto Rico there's that vast mm. amount of greenery. Mm. So how can we bring that greenery back into the hearts of our people? Mm. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I gave a TEDx talk a, a few years ago um, where I said that um, Puerto Rico was cultivated for sugar cane, not for kale. Mm. And that is 100% um, true of how agriculture has been, a, como se dice desarrollado in English? Uh, developed, sorry. Um, has been developed in Puerto Rico. And I think that um, a couple of things to what you're saying. One, um, of all the positive things that might come as a result of this awful moment. Um, I've heard from a lot of friends, colleagues, um, my cousin who produces an individual line of um, fresh pressed juices and, and honestly raises her entire family off like knocking coconuts down and selling them at different um, <laughs> uh, food fairs, at least she did before the hurricane. There is a tremendous amount of agricultural development that was happening before the hurricane mm -hmm. that has now continued. So something really encouraging that I've seen are a lot of seed sharing programs getting a lot of energy. People sending seeds to Puerto Rico. Yeah. Um, there is an incredible um, company, family owned, called Desde Mi Huerta in Puerto Rico that has been cultivating organic seeds of things that grow really well in Puerto Rico 
for years. Um, there are, I wish I had other organizations at the tip of my tongue, but I, I don't at the moment. I will say that, that what you're describing is a growing movement and a growing consideration. And, um, and um, not to talk too, too much about my own book, but one of the main things I wanted to do with Coconuts and Collards was to offer anyone in the world, but particularly Puerto Ricans, an opportunity to experience the flavors that we love so much from our island's cuisine outside of this kind of very standard deep fried thing, you know, root vegetable, rice and bean, roast pork, whatever, you know, kind of like a cornucopia of very limited amount of things that feel very Puerto Rican. And so in order for something to speak back to your culture, what else does sofrito taste good in? The answer is everything, right? <laughs> everything tastes good with sofrito. Everything <laughs> tastes good with sazon, like the, the, everything. Popcorn, you name it, tacos, all of that stuff. So um, I think that there, I think it's, again, it's like so soon to know because so much of the island still doesn't have just the basic resource of power to their homes and ability to communicate right back and forth between the mainland. But I think there's something really powerful that's starting to happen and, and I feel very fortunate to get to talk about it at all. Um, and I will to and thank you for your question because I'm now gonna have at the ready all of the businesses <laughs> that are doing this um, so that I can lift them up as well, so thank you. So, 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 Juan, I just wanted to, to, to piggyback. That question was so, it was so, it was so powerful. And that's why I'm so happy to be here at, at Just Food. Because the movement um, that you're speaking about and the question that you lift up is a movement that we have uh, been put in practice in Detroit uh, for a long time. And what you're talking about is food sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Is that how do you become a food sovereign city? or mm -hmm. a food sovereign country, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because even though what the devastation that happened in Puerto Rico is very similar to the devastation that happened, Abbott, it wasn't climate, it was economic. It was a hurricane that destroyed mm -hmm. Detroit, an mm -hmm. economic hurricane that mm -hmm. destroyed Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do now in a city that's 140 square miles, a city that you can put the island of Manhattan, Boston, and San Francisco mm -hmm. in, where you now have a foreclosure rate that is so high that African Americans who did have wealth are losing their homes, and those homes are now being destroyed, where you now have a quarter of the city that's vacant. Mm -hmm. When you have every major national grocery store that left the city of Detroit, and so now you have no national grocery store chain mm -hmm. in the city of Detroit. Whole Foods came back in 2014. It was the only one. Mm -hmm. And as us young people were very devastated by that idea of where we're gonna get fruits and vegetables, it was the elders who said, baby, don't you know we know how to grow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was the elders who said, we got land, mm -hmm. we have proximity to water, we've been saving seeds, and we have a willing workforce. And so I would love to see this interchange of ideas and strategies between a Puerto Rico and a place like Detroit so we can make this thing global, this connection. We share with y'all what we're doing, y'all share with us what you all are doing, and baby, we can make this thing a global partnership. Mm -hmm in sharing and exchanging ideas on Go how ahead, we Davida. grow our own food and we don't have to depend on this global industrialized food system yeah. to feed us, our babies, and our children. I was just gonna say Davida's recipe oh. in Feed the Resistance is your family's cabbage that speaks to this whole story. Um, that you have always known how to grow, how to hold each other, how to lift each other up, how to take care of each other. Um, so it was just what I was thinking. I just wanted to read your words while you were talking. That was it. Thank you. No, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah. No, really. <laughs> um, as always, David is like right on time <laughs> and giving the right message. I feel like this is like the best way that we could really close the AM plenary and really hold and hold that while we break for lunch and really be able to come back together again after lunch um, to 
share. This is, we're talking about sovereignty here. We're talking about justice here. We're talking about saving seeds. We're talking about gentrification. We're talking about saving our land, saving our food, saving our work, making sure that historically marginalized people and their work are not minimized. Um, and we're amplifying and we're pushing back. We're pushing back our narrative, we're changing narrative. So I'm really glad that you're, you all lifted that up today so well. Um, I know that others are gonna be able to share and lift that up later on. Um, um, we're gonna break for lunch, we're like right at time, so this is like perfect. <laughs> Um, I want to make sure folks have like their full hour. So there is um, a closed youth lunch panel that Aishima and Christina mentioned. Um, adults, we're hoping that y'all did bring your lunch. <laughs> but if you did not bring your lunch, there is an insert um, on local eats in your program and on your Topi app that will let you know about um, neighborhood small businesses that are, um, are either able to offer discounts or are nearby and you can grab something. But we really encourage people to come back so you're able to start on time. Uh, <laughs> presenters be in this space so you can start on time because we just wanna make sure that everyone has a chance to speak and everyone has a chance to share. But I usually have a lot to say, but I'm really so moved and I've been going back and forth from holding and crying. So <laughs> I'm just gonna really just offer gratitude to you all um, I want to offer gratitude to my tidy but mighty staff um, of five folks. <laughs> um, that you will be seeing around because they're super busy. Um, the conference team, the interns, the volunteers that have been helping out and jumping in and just pitching in um, for free. I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I want to also lift up our board um, of directors. Um, some of them might be in the audience right now. Um, I think Karen is actually was held um, in uh, weather-related um, issues in Atlanta, but um, she sends her blessings and she said to continue to resist um, and, and lift up your work um, um, this morning. So um, planning committee, I also really cannot stress enough Thank you to the planning committee, Cheryl, I, uh, Cheryl, Steph, Sh Sherry, Kevin, Aishima, Christina, Yadira, Aki. Uh, yes, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone. So and. Thank you, oh. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it, you know, people thought we were a little bit crazy to like try to pull on a conference, even though Just Food has done a conference for years, um, 10 plus years in some form. Um, building a conference this way with this intentionality was really building it from scratch mm -hmm. um, and building it from scratch in a very f uh, few months in time with a very small staff. Um, so it really is, the work of the people and what I'm really happy to hear and see that it makes all this work worthwhile is that we should have a platform and a table that is of us and by us. And if, if my work is to bring that and be able to create a platform for new voices and emerging voices to be here so we can share and learn, then that is the work of Just Food and that's what we're gonna do.